I'm pleased and honored to open the series of uh, sessions on the uh, advisory groups. This morning, the colleagues from the EOSC board have uh, presented each advisory group and task force, and uh, Wilhelm Widmark beautifully presented the aims and objectives of the advisory group on uh, research careers uh, uh, and curricula. Um, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Maria Luisa. Yes. I think there's something with your microphone. I think it's um, it's touching something and it's, um, it's quite noisy. Noisy? Now, now it should be fine. Um, maybe just avoid to, to touch the microphone um, as it's interrupting your speech. You may continue. Okay, sorry. Um, I was saying that Willem Widmark this morning presented the aims and objectives of the advisory group on research careers and curricula uh, that uh, will mainly address two operational objectives of the SRIA. Uh, the first is to increasingly integrate open science skills in European uh, research performing organization, also through the adoption of curricula and training frameworks related to data stewardship through the lifespan of the partnership. And the second operational objective is the co-design and adopt a rewards and recognition framework for fair and open data practices in research during the lifespan of the partnership. Why we launched this, uh, we wanted to have this advisory group because the context of increasing volumes of data being created by researchers and the strengthening of requirements for research data management and data sharing has created demands for new and evolving set of competencies and skills for researchers who create and use the data, and also for the professionals who support them. And in general, the fostering of disabilities is not, at least not explicitly addressed by current training or formal education plans. And also the career structure of the support profession, like data scientists, data librarians, data managers, data analysts, data stewardship, and the infrastructure providers and developers is not defined. Therefore, it's very important this advisory group to help us in, uh, you know, uh, uh, better define the gaps in the actual SRIA and also uh, to link with the uh, actual project already ongoing and the ones that uh, will come in the next years and uh, uh, also link to the uh, groups that are, you know, implementing the, uh, the SRIA. Now, this advisory group is structured in three task forces, data stewardship, curricula, and career path, the research careers recognition and credit, and upskilling countries to engage in EOSC. This afternoon, in, this, uh, in the first subsession, the chairs of these task forces will present the charters of the task force, and then we will open the floor for more contribution from um, that you know, arrive from, from, the, from the community. I don't want to take away time to the speakers. And therefore, I want to give immediately the floor to the, um, to um, Ilir Asani Mavriki, Mavriki from the Graz University uh, of Technology, uh, who will uh, tell us about the charter of the task force data stewardship, curricula, and career path. I remember that each speaker has five minutes for presenting the task. And then at the end, we will have a, a question and answer. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So the charter of the task for data stewardship, curricula, and career path was uh, drafted by my colleagues, Vera Matzer and Francesca Contini and myself, and we had also consultations with nine other volunteers that um, contributed with their comments in the charter. Next slide, please. So what is the scope of this task force? The main focus of this task force is on the data steward roles. So we want to define some core set of competences and skills, but also uh, elaborate on other skills on other specializations that are necessary for data stewards. And this is depending on the setting and on the discipline. We, one of the main goals is also to recognize overlap with other roles and especially those roles 
that were defined in the digital skills for fair and open science reports, such as data curator, EOSC educator, data scientist, scientist, or even a research software engineer. We finally identified some uh, dependencies, especially with other two task forces in this advisory group, research career, recognition and credit, and as well upskilling countries to engage in EOS. But there is already um, a very good basis in this regard. So there are two um, interest groups at RDA, so professionalization, professionalizing data stewardship and also education and training on handling of research data. And we already um, contact, contacted the persons re responsible for these uh, interest groups. So I think uh, a liaison and coordination with them is very important for the work of this task force. And of course, we want to identify other projects that deal with these topics, especially those uh, initiatives and projects that were mentioned in the report. We antic anticipate a duration of 24 months for this task force. Next slide, please. What are the core activities that we defined? We defined four task forces. So of course, we want to engage uh, all the stack stakeholders and do dissemination. We want to engage them in a co-creation process to define to work with us in this task force. In a second task, we want to define a minimal data stewardship curricula, but of course, taking into account the previous work. And in the set of the slides, we provided also the references. So also the reports and the publications, especially from the Netherlands and Denmark. So they already try to define uh, the role and the competences of data stewards. Now we want to make this more visible and more present by uh, also um, establishing some recommendations for uh, research institutions, but also for uh, researchers themselves. In a task three, we want to concentrate on data stewardship career paths. So we want to define uh, how these career paths relate to other existing roles in international in discipline, disciplinary specific uh, context. And we want to also come up with recommendations in uh, regard to recognition and rewards for data management activities. Because especially researchers, they change career paths when they decide to become a data steward. So we want to come up with some recommendations. What happens with them if, for example, they want to go back to their discipline specific research? We anticipate also some implementation examples. So we want to have some special use cases and with them, we want also to try to implement our recommendations. Next slide, please. Our working methodology looks as follows. So we want to release the work in, ver in versions in order to uh, incorporate feedback and um, to have some lessons learned. We want to ensure a co-creation process so between theoretical development and implementation examples. We want to hold as well public consultations through surveys, interviews, workshops, and we want to closely co communicate with other relevant task forces and with international initiatives. We want to use use cases not only within the task force, but also outside. Next slide, please. In regard to membership, so we anticipate a number of members between 25 and 30. And of course, um, we want to make sure that all the uh, criteria that are designed, de defined by US Association are fulfilled. We uh, are planning to have, uh, beside co-chairs, also co-task leaders, uh, ideally two per task. And we define some other uh, criteria. For example, we want to make sure that the spread of contributions, especially across tasks two and four, is, uh, is there. Uh, maybe uh, the members who want to be to join our task force can also explain the willingness or indicate the willingness to serve as co-chair or co-task leaders, and they should commit to provide significant input for the duration of the task force. Thank you. In the next slide, uh, there are some references. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions. Here are also the contact email addresses of the charter coordinators. Uh, thank you. I want to take the opportunity to thanks very much all the uh, the, the um, uh, conveners of this of the task forces who really did uh, uh, a lot of work. They dedicated a lot of time in uh, start drafting the charters uh, and also uh, all the colleagues that uh, gave a substantial contribution to the writing of this chart. Thank you very much, and um, I will give now the floor to uh, the next task force, uh, which is the uh, Research Careers Recognition and Credit that will be presented by Francesca Di Donato. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, our task force in this uh, first stage uh, was composed of 13 active members. Um, in order to draft the charter, we had eight meetings starting from the end of April, and we worked together remotely on the charter, uh, starting from a, a draft uh, collected by the, the coordinators. As a, and as a common approach, we agreed on the decision to produce a high-level charter and to recommend to dedicate uh, more time to the charter itself and the methodologies during the first phases of the task work. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the main aims of the charters are to address in incentives and rewards for researchers to manage and share data, code, and other research outputs, activities, and processes. These incentives and rewards will be based on making criteria of open science and fair principles an integral part of academic career progression and grant assessment processes, and the task force will identify various research stakeholders, groups, and their specific roles and responsibilities in support of embedding incentives and rewards for researchers in assessment processes. Next, please. Uh, for what concerns uh, dependencies, there's a risk of overlap with other EOSC task forces and notably with the upskilling countries, the data stewardship and the research uh, engagement and adoption. And this will need to be monitored both to avoid duplication and to promote synergies and alignment of approaches. And the next one, please. And the, the, we plan to organize the core activities into four phases for a total duration of 24 months. The planning phase, which lasts two months, in which the task force will agree upon a terms of reference document to guide the project over its two year span. And this document will include the definitions of appropriate methodologies to structure activities. The analysis phase from months two to nine to make a landscape analysis of existing high-level initiatives and good practices and the needs of the research system related to recognition and credit and to provide a gap analysis of needs. And the third phase from months six to 20, which is devoted to identify open science principles that underlie the good practices and initiatives analyzed in phase two and to develop recommendations targeted to different stakeholders for improving recognition systems and credit. And phase four from month uh, 18 to 24 to uh, define a future monitoring strategy for the implementation of recommendations and practices, including the possible elaboration of tools and supporting mechanism. Next, please. Um, as said, the task force recommends to set up a methodology in the planning phase, a detailed methodology. The preliminary working methodology proposed include an initial desk work to develop the landscape and gap analysis, discussing and identifying principles that underlie the good practices analyzed in phase two, and uh, determine actions that are of relevance to EOSC, to develop recommendations founded upon agreed principles aimed at different stakeholders groups 
on how to embed open science practices and fair principles into all forms of research assessment processes and discuss and define potential monitoring and support mechanisms and tools to further promote the implementation of the recommendations made. So the task force also expects that all outputs support material and methodologies associated with the work of this task force will be shared in accordance with open science practices and the fair principles. And uh, last slide, yes, please. We expect uh, for what concerns uh, membership that the activities surrounding the research and researcher uh, recognition should involve as many stakeholders groups as possible. A size of, uh, for this task force from 20 to 25 members would be optimal to manage it. And moreover, as a condition for membership, members should commit to active contribution in all discussions and participate in the development of outputs of the group. Uh, lastly, the task force should pursue diverse representation and ensure that its activities and outputs are inclusive and promote equal opportunities. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Maria Luisa, maybe you, you may have to unmute. Uh, yes, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so I wanted to thank you, Francesca, for uh, also for being time, uh, and therefore we will have time after the the presentation of the last the the the, the last task force charter uh, for some questions. So now I give the floor to Milena Dobreva, who uh, will. Uh, uh, present the, the charter of the upskilling countries to engage in EOSC task force. Elena. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's great to see many colleagues and uh, to meet new ones. And also, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to see the interest of participants in this session, how they can eventually join and contribute in the future. This is really vital for all of us. So I will present very briefly the task force charter proposal of the, uh, on the topic of upskilling countries to engage in EOSC. You will see more information on the slides than I'm going to talk about, but this is mostly to document uh, the process for those of you who will be coming back to the recording. I would like to thank all the contributors in our task force. We were very diverse geographically and also in terms of representation of different types of stakeholders. I'm not going to read all the names, but this is everyone who uh, took part in the uh, creation of the document. Next slide, please. So uh, the scope of this task force uh, is the national, um, the national level. And here uh, we need to explain that in some countries there, there is national coordination. In other countries, we don't have national coordination yet, but there are strong grassroots initiatives. And when we speak about aligning uh, uh, initiatives and supporting the onboarding uh, in, the, in the various countries, we have to capture the various uh, national situations. We also see the dependencies with the work of different uh, task forces. Here you see four of them listed, plus multiple projects which look into, into various aspects of uh, educating specialists in the area of open science. However, the emphasis here is on the national level or the national impact. Next slide, please. We, uh, like the other task forces, we think that the actual work uh, on uh, uh, this topic will develop in the next two years. Our aims um, are uh, combining the development of a scoping instrument. So in order to see what is the national situation, we need to have some sort of a measurement tool. We, we need to, um, to, to have something which can be applied across different uh, countries. So the uh, first aim of this uh, task force is to develop a scoping instrument, then to illustrate how it can be applied, and also to support the dialogue with the vital stakeholders in different countries. Here we uh, concentrate on some of the uh, stakeholders, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this uh, diagram. We have 10 different types of actors in the EOSC, but our priority are the policy makers, the academic managers, the researchers and the citizens. Next place, slide, please. Uh, likewise, uh, similar to the other task forces, we uh, think that this work uh, will be done in several chunks. We have three phases, a pre preparatory one, which will take six months to develop the scoping uh, uh, instrument and to do some initial uh, testing, then initial implementation and refinement of this instrument, and then the full implementation. Next slide, please. And uh, the methodology is also a mixed one. We will form subgroups for each uh, uh, task and we will uh, combine desktop research and uh, consultancies with uh, uh, human subjects, those who have uh, ideas and were involved in these processes. Next slide, please. So uh, our key outcomes are uh, the scoping instrument, then a documentation, how to apply it, uh, the idea here is that we give a tool into the uh, hands of those who want to assess national situations. And we also will have a final report which will include national snapshots and suggestions on how to move forward in areas which can be developed further. Next slide, please. So how we are going to uh, achieve this? Similarly to other task forces, we believe we need about 30 members which represent different types of stakeholders. It's very important to have people who have some experience either on a national level or grassroots. And I also wanted to mention some of the limitations and they uh, reflect on some of the questions. This is a voluntary activity. We were meeting once or twice a week while we were preparing this. So this is a commitment. It would be great if we can have some support to have ethical clearance for human subject uh, studies, which involve interviews and surveys. If we cannot get this, we can have open consultations, but they have their limitations. Obviously, these are also uh, multiple developments to follow and coordinate, which happen in the same time. And we also hope that EOSC Secretariat is going to do a great work in um, capturing the, the what is happening in this domain, which grows really very quickly. Next slide, please. So there will be a panel a little bit later. Uh, two of our contributors will speak at this panel, plus two other people. Uh, join the panel and get in touch if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Uh, I, just, I just want to answer to some question that uh, I found in the, in the, um, in the chat. Uh, one question is related on the timing of the of the call for participation to the different task forces so the uh, the call for participation will be launched at the end of this week or beginning next week and will be open for for one month um, we will allow the participation of only one for one task force per person uh, because uh, when we launch the um, yeah the call for for interest uh, uh, for the for the writing of, of the um, of the charters, we received so many um, many uh, requests, and therefore to allow people to part to more people to participate, we want to restrict to only one one task force per person. Uh, so this is um, and uh, you can find also um, other um, information about the the process. Uh, in the um, in the fac uh, about task forces that are um, that are online. I ask uh, kindly Rob if can put in the in the chat uh, the link to the to the fac. Uh, now we are a little bit, you know, uh, late. Therefore, I will uh, I will reserve the um, the the questions uh, at the end. And uh, now I want to introduce the second subsession that is. Uh, for the research careers recognition and credit. And I will give the floor to uh, Jean Polonen um, uh, from the Federation of Finnish Learn Society uh, that will talk about making fairer, fair ER assessment possible. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Janne Pelönen and I work as the head of planning at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. And I present you the main results of two 
two co joint EOSC co-creation projects titled uh, European Overview of Korean Merit Systems, uh, led by myself, and Vision for Research Data in Research Careers, led by my colleague Henrika Mustajoki. The project team, coordinated by our federation, included also international experts, notably uh, Kathleen Gregory from Dance, uh, the Netherlands, and Dragan Ivanovic from the University of Novi Sad in Serbia. The results of our two projects were published in April in a technical final report, making fairer assessments possible, which is openly available in Zenodo along with datasets. Uh, just to uh, keep track of time, I skip what we actually did and go to results. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in this report, we build on extensive document overview, survey, case studies, and co-creation processes to argue for fairer academic assessments that are rooted in both the FAIR guidelines for data management as well as policies for the responsible metrics and assessment of research. Uh, we believe that change in research culture is encouraged by developing responsible assessment fully recognizing diversity of research outputs, activities and missions, especially those promoting open science. We need to focus, of course, more on qualitative assessments, but we also need more reliable, comprehensive, well-structured and comparable data to inform assessment by experts. Therefore, we argue that the path to making assessments fairer requires three steps, make it meaningful, make it possible, and make it rewarding. First, we need to know what we want to value and evaluate. To do this, we start by considering the goals of research and do not limit ourselves to evaluations to what is technically possible or easy to measure. We take into consideration the diversity of practices, outputs, missions and impacts of academic work and differences between fields. Secondly, we need to make it possible for researchers to report, make visible and explain the diverse outputs, activities and impacts of their work. Integration of relevant information from different sources is facilitated by open assessment infrastructure. I will come back to this soon. And thirdly, we need to include a broad range of outputs, activities and impacts of academic works in criteria for hiring, promotion and funding. Our report includes also a technical vision of the FERA assessments infrastructure developed with the lead especially of Dragan Ivanovic. The vision is presented in the picture on the right. Uh, Dragan would be able to explain all the technical properties of this vision, but I can tell why Europe needs the vision. Our survey and case studies clearly demonstrate that currently rewarding researchers for open science is lacking reliable, comprehensive, well-structured and comparable qualitative and quantitative data or metrics about most research outputs and practices that we want to value in assessment. The only well covered and recognized open science activity is open access publications. There is also a need to develop global and local information systems, data models, terms and vocabularies, as well as consistent use of persistent identifiers for the full diversity of open science practices. Another important challenge is that the existing qualitative and quantitative information on research outputs, activities and impacts produced by researchers, institutions and infrastructures is scattered across various platforms. And it is difficult to use and reuse this information systematically in assessments. Europe already has a strong open science infrastructure landscape for sharing and discovering 
research data and publications. But we also need to invest in a dedicated infrastructures for supporting assessment with a broad range of information about research and open science that is useful for assessments and evaluators. We believe that EOSC could play a strong role in development of this infrastructure, which integrates research entities and facilitates interoperability between international, national, and institutional research information systems and platforms to allow for fairer open science assessment culture to emerge. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'm giving the floor to Alan Bodopievich, who will talk about the Europe incentives for supporting uh, ORDM and FAIR. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. OK. <clears throat> uh, so we have already seen the great progress uh, in previous lectures. In this, in this domain, I will present you uh, results uh, of, of, the, of our report uh, that is done within the NIFOS project, uh, so uh, National Initi Initiatives for Open Science in Europe. Uh, also, uh, in previous lectures during this day, we, we heard that uh, EOSC is a web of uh, fair data and services, as Sarah Jones said. And uh, in the words of uh, Bob Jones, the research data is a base of the EOSC uh, existence. Uh, next slide, please. Still, uh, we are pushing this cloud to take off in times of the reproducibility crisis. Uh, the facts uh, shown here uh, are present for a long period of time in terms of scientific communication, but these days uh, they came into focus. The overall technological ecosystem uh, has evolved, but uh, it seems that scientific community is lagging behind using the old paradigms of communicating research results. Uh, so what is the problem that we are trying to, to solve? Uh, well, uh, research data for, res for a researcher is a resource, a resource that makes a difference, that provides uh, prestige, the possibility for publication, a uh, resource uh, that has a potential of um, making money, either through a new workplace, scientific degree, new projects, patents, etc. Et and uh, this is the current environment and uh, relationships inside of it. Uh, the crisis uh, reflects in the following, following uh, points. So the, the obstacles in data reuse and validation results in an uh, insufficient return on public investment. Uh, it also undermines the trust in science. Uh, there is increased number of retractions and uh, it should be dealt with a more open and transparent review process, even in early stages of research. And of course, we should somehow overcome the, the, the dominant uh, publish or perish principle. Uh, in uh, NIFUS Euro project, we have conducted an uh, extensive landscape analysis and the analysis of current good, good practices uh, in the partner countries and uh, uh, in the uh, overall Europe, uh, other countries. One of the results is a report on rewards and incentives for supporting uh, open research data management and fair that takes into account all stakeholders from researchers and research performing organizations over policymakers and funders to journals, publishers, and platforms. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we identified uh, uh, some recommendations. Uh, these recommendations are summarized in 10 topics and associated activities. 
that should drive the change of the current environment, thus fostering the change of survival tactics uh, in the ecosystem of science. So where to intervene? First, regarding policymakers, uh, we should mandate OA publishing, including data sets and software, mandating uh, data management plans, setting up policies and fair data publishing and archiving. Uh, we should integ integrate uh, the open research data management and fair activities into research assessment and evaluation at various levels, of course. Uh, on the level of promotion of researchers, recruitment procedures, uh, project proposals, assessment, institution evaluation, etc. We should, of course, support data infrastructures in the in the long run. Uh, it means uh, development, maintenance, personal costs, training activities, and and so on. Uh, also, <clears throat> uh, we should increase the skills of, of all included in the process from researchers to to library staff and, and other stakeholders. Uh, we should uh, adopt research integrity policies. Uh, we should uh, also improve uh, publisher practices, journal practices or, or, or platform function publishing platforms functionalities uh, by enabling and mandating fully transparent editorial policies, publication uh, uh, or ev ev evaluability of data sets alongside uh, research papers in open access, uh, develop interoperability with other OS infrastructures and implementing more transparent peer review process and high ethical standards into publishing practices, also enabling the, uh, text and data mining. Uh, so, uh, yes, it's, well, more or less easy to intervene, but how to acknowledge uh, these practices. So major changes should be done in the current reward system in scholarly communication that would fully acknowledge uh, not only the open research data management and FAIR, but the open science practices in general. So we should put scientific quality over uh, quantity, ensure uh, reproducibility of the results, generate uh, fairer data, curate and preserve data, and so on. So the awards could be done through awarding uh, priority in equipment service provision, equipment or service provision, awarding some extra points according to the official research assessment system uh, in the terms of project evaluation, career advancements, allocation of funds, awarding conference membership fees or funding the, the APCs. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, NIFAS Europe uh, will back the core reward and incentives uh, mechanisms by supporting the related activities, ensuring their alignment across the reconciled regional ecosystem. Uh, at the same time, uh, we will keep track of all relevant developments in Europe, seeking to uh, assess their applicability in individual local contexts. We are also supporting the onboarding of services and uh, engaging national scientific communities in, into, into the EOSC. Uh, you can check uh, our uh, website, NIFOS Europe, and uh, you can check this, this uh, deliverable uh, that I was talking about and, and all other materials produced as the results of, of project activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, for this uh, interesting presentation. I wonder whether the um, uh, task force uh, members uh, uh, want to comment about the, the results of the work you have presented, and if they think that there are elements that can be taken also uh, to, for the work they, they are going to do for the, for the task force. I ask, uh, Francesca Frontini, if she wants to comment. 
Francesca Di Donato, sorry. If she want to comment. On this question, where and when the, the initial call of the task force was published? Yeah, uh, is it correct? I see this last question to me. Well, where and we, when? No, I, I, will, uh, no I, I wanted you to comment about these uh, two last presentations. Okay. On so, the, on the uh, research careers recognition. And yes. How so, their input can be, if there is an input that can be useful for implementing the work that you already have done inside the task force. Yes, so uh, of course, uh, uh, I find, I found both uh, uh, very relevant to us and uh, um, I would like to, to connect also to another question I, I had in the chat. So why we didn't explicitly uh, mention it, uh, existing initiatives, uh, uh, ongoing initiatives uh, or uh, organization which are working on the, these topics. This was a choice which I get, uh, explained the reasons in the beginning of my presentation. So to remain uh, uh, general, so to be uh, as much uh, universal as possible. So we are aware of a lot of initiatives and uh, uh, in my, my experience, I, I, um, I participated also to, to uh, um, workshop of the, of the fair, uh, if, uh, um, fair year, uh, the first presentation workshops. And uh, so there is an alignment uh, with the, 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 the charter we are uh, we drafted. And of course, uh, uh, I would like also to invite also other uh, stakeholders and uh, members to, to apply later to join the task force, because it's really important that uh, uh, we have a representation of the existing initiatives and uh, uh, the, the um, organizations. Um, thank you, Francesca. There are a, a number of questions in the chat. Uh, one is where and when the initial call for task forces were, was published. Um, well, it, it was published. Um, I mean, the, 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 the topic of the task force was, uh, uh, was established during the um, um, EOSC, EOSC board late in March. And then we launched the uh, call for interest uh, um, through our channels and essentially was uh, uh, the, um, the, um, was sent to the members and the observers of the EOSC Association. Of course, the participation to the task force is also open to uh, external participants, is not restricted to members and to, and to observers. Uh, but uh, in case of too many, um, too many uh, requests, we will uh, privilege uh, members and observers. But especially for this task force, um, what we, we envisage is the participation of uh, uh, also of uh, 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 of all the stakeholders that can can give a contribute. And I see here in the chat the interest of uh, representative of um, European uh, University Association. They will will be very the, their contribution will be very important either in structuring the the task force, but also. Uh, for the implementation phase of the of the results of the task force. Therefore, I encourage them to uh, apply for participating to the to the task force uh, um, as soon as we will open the we will open the call. Um, other um, questions are related to the uh, to the link with other initiatives and, um, and project. This is very important. Uh, the, 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 the project that are ongoing and the, the ones that will be launched in the next uh, years will, will, uh, you know, will be for the implementation 
of, um, of the EOSC. Now there is, um, it's very important that, uh, you know, uh, the SRIA will be updated, the, doc the strategic document will be updated with all the um, with all the input that we will receive through the uh, task forces, and therefore uh, through the partnership, these messages will be, uh, you know, transferred to the commission for uh, also for the um, the establishment of the new calls uh, in order to fund initiatives that are coherent with the, um, the objectives and the aims uh, of the of our of, of the Sharia. And, uh, and of course, with the collaboration of the advisory groups and task forces. I don't know whether there are other burning questions in, um, in the chat at the moment. If not, um, I, uh, I will start um, the next subsession since we receive uh, many uh, contribution for uh, for the data stewardship curricula and career paths. We decided to um, to um, to propose a kind of panel discussion, uh, giving the possibility to the panelists to uh, answer to specific question and uh, and also to present uh, their view um, their view on the um, on this topic. So, um, so um, I want to start uh, giving the floor again to Ilira Sani uh, Maviri from the Graz University. And, um, and since establishing data stewardship program is uh, a recognized mandatory requirement, um, my question to Ilira is what challenges emerge in setting data stewardship program in the uh, Austrian University as an example? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this very important question. Uh, before jumping into the main challenges that we identified, I just want to shortly describe how we, how we are organized in Austria. So we have this national initiative to uh, establish data stewardship programs as a part of a project with the name Fair Data Austria, which is funded by the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. We have six partner institutions and 23 associated partners. And of course, in this um, initiative, we want to involve as much uh, research institutions as possible. We want to align data stewardship efforts and activities on a national, but also on international level. So uh, immediately at the beginning of our endeavor, we contacted, for example, few devs because we know that they already have established a data stewardship program there. So we wanted to exchange our experience and to learn from them. Then we realized, okay, but maybe those models that exist, they are not uh, directly, like, so to say, translated in Austrian context. So we wanted to define the models, profiles, and competences for uh, data stewards that are suitable for our research institutions. We are also about to define some training programs. Our goal is, so by the end of um, next year, to establish also a kind of self-assessment tool uh, that would help then institutions to identify this, uh, the, the perfect model to establish data stewardship. And this would be like a matchmaking tool between requirements, for example, university size, available resources, field of expertise, number of data management plans that are produced per year and some existing solutions such as number of data stewards, what kind of model, is it a centralized or decentralized model, profiles and training uh, possibilities. Next slide, please. And of course, we faced a lot of challenges uh, uh, trying to establish data stewardship programs. At the beginning, we realized that there are many differences between partner, partner universities. So we didn't have like a common understanding what does it mean being a data steward? Because of course there are some existing roles like uh, repository managers, data librarians, and they do actually some of the tasks that are planned for data stewards. So there are differences in the models in the process that are being implemented, but there are also differences in the stages in the process. So there, there are, research institutions that do not have many, many fun, uh, any funding or they do not have any positions in this regard, but they want to establish them. 
And there are differences in priorities for data steward profiles and also for, their, for the expectations. We face a lot of um, challenges in communicating the need for data stewardship. And this is in all the levels. So at Tilgras, we have currently three data stewards that work in discipline um, specific manner. So they have a background in mechanical engineering, physics, and life sciences. And when they talk to researchers, of course, uh, they do not uh, get the, the, um, uh, the support they need. So in some disciplines or in, at some institutes, there is an increased need for, for data stewardship, but some of the researchers, they want to continue to work on their own. So they think they are fine with the work that they are doing right now. I have to say, so we are engaging researchers at all the levels, and uh, this is uh, really time and resource consuming, but I think if we do not do this now, we would have difficulties later on. Then communicating with the management. So some, sometimes the deans, the faculties, they are not aware of the problems that uh, are present at the faculty. So we have to, of course, combine bottom up and uh, top bottom approaches, but sometimes um, you have to find a good balance of these two approaches. Then one of other challenges is the lack of clearly defined roles and responsibilities. And this is also uh, evident in many reports that were produced in, in the last years. The, there is a, a chance that data stewards really lose themselves by doing many things at, at once. For, for example, uh, at our uh, university, we are experiencing a high demand on data science and programming skills. So when we speak to researchers, of course, they want to get also like machine learning support from data stewards. So this is uh, maybe a good input also for the task force data stewards career uh, path because we have to uh, come up with some, but with some programs, how can, if data stewards are interested to, to have such a specialization, they should have an opportunity also to learn maybe machine learning and to provide this as a support. Then another challenge is in repurposing the existing positions. So maybe some uh, existing positions in data librarian context or other positions should be um, made like data steward position. And there is a challenge on how, how to deal with this kind of, uh, of uh, changing the role and, um, and the profile. The main challenge is funding new positions. So I think as a community, uh, we have to work together in, in convincing all the stakeholders, in convincing the management of the university that they have to invest in data steward positions. And I think making these positions sustainable and uh, taking care of their career paths is one of the open questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Iliri. There are actually also other experiences uh, performed in other contexts. For instance, FAIR's FAIR in partnership with the CoData uh, RDA schools are delivering training to data stewards, instructors, and uh, early career researchers. Um, therefore, I want to ask Yug Shannon from the Royal Holloway University of uh, London, uh, what are the lessons learned in creating communities of data steward instructors uh, and data enable researchers in the context of the Fair Fair and the CoData RDA schools? All right. Thank you very much, Maria Luisa. Um, again, I'll try and do a very uh, short introduction here. If if, if if I can just see if my people can show my slides for a second. Um, oh, if I can show my slides, thank you. Great. So what I'll do is, So what I'll start off with is just talking briefly about the data steward instructor training that, that's been done within Fair's Fair. And to note 
what has been happening is, is that we've been having a number of conversations with people working, setting up data storage networks in a number of regions or nations. So specifically in Ireland, Flanders, the north of England, and in Poland. What this is semi-anecdotal. In other words, this is not based on survey data, but on conversations. What we seem to be, uh, what appears to be occurring here is that higher education institutions are very much employing data stewards across Europe, and that's that's happening, all right? But it's important to note that they are being employed in terms of small teams or indeed as single individuals. Furthermore, they're newly employed. So in other words, many of them are in this position for less than six months. And furthermore, they are not even, you know, often they're not even described as being data stewards. They're given a whole host of different titles. So this is something that in terms of developing curricula and so on, this is something that we should be thinking about. In particular, what we should be doing is thinking about how do we build them up as a network because they're young and they're new and perhaps not very confident. In that respect, what we've been doing within the, the FAIRS FAIR data steward and structure training is providing this at a regional level, which discusses pedagogy, because as data stewards, they'll be doing lots of training themselves. Talking about what does data stewardship mean, which was talked about previous in the previous talk, but also using those events as something of a networking occasion so that people actually are in touch with each other and realize that there are things that are better, 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 better going on there. And we've run a few instances so far of that, uh, of that so far. We have run and will be running over, over the rest of the year. Um, just also in terms of briefly, just to note, we see there's already been discussions on curriculum development. Um, I note the fairs that within fairs fair, there's been some excellent work on developing a, a fair competence framework for data stewards. And from a domain specific perspective, Elixir is providing a data stewardship competency framework as well. Likewise, it's also been mentioned previously, the RDA professionalizing data stewardship interest group is also of worth of interest. Finally, just to note also uh, in there, uh, I would also suggest please stay until the, the end of, of this, the, the, the session this afternoon, because Helen Clare of GIS will be talking about the community of practice that's being run within open air, which is another sort of excellent forum for nascent data stewards to, to, to get together. Finally, um, I was also asked just by the organizers just also to, to mention another activity which is called terms for fair skills so what that is is a terminology that's being developed to describe the competencies skills and knowledge necessary to make data fair and to keep it fair so in this case this is uh, the the use cases for this is primarily for discovery of training materials so i'm a completely new data steward i want to figure out what materials are out there that i can use designing a curriculum identifying skill gaps, and indeed defining job descriptions. This is not, even though this talk has got the Fairs Fair logo, it's important to note that this is very much a cross community effort. So this is over 20 different organizations are working together. This is not, so to stress, this is not just Fairs Fair. This is Go Fair. this is a DCC. This is a whole range of, of organizations. It is at the present moment at reached version 0.1, uh, um, here are some of the details uh, about that, and here is the, the, the project page for it. There's also, this was pushed forward a lot through support through the EOS co-creation fund, which was enormously useful, and there's a technical report. To note, this work is ongoing. Laura Malloy of CoData is the project manager, uh, so uh, if, if I don't have answers to, to following questions, I will pass them on to, to, to her. I'll share this, the, the, these, these slide notes in the, in the chat as well, if people want to follow up. Thank you, Yug. Thank you, really uh, a very nice piece of work. Uh, and I think uh, that is right. It's very important, not only the formal learning approach, but also, uh, you know, what we call the peer learning approach through the community of practice and also 
uh, yeah, some learning on the job approach through, you know, um, um, exchange programs and uh, um, between pe uh, peers. So thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Now I want to give the floor to Enrico Guarini from the University of Milano Bicocca and ask him how the new Horizon 2020 funded uh, project, uh, Right Train Plus, aim to contribute to the EOS by developing a sustainable career path, a sustainable career path for um, yeah, these new figures and in general to uh, operators and managers that works in research infrastructure and other kind of uh, research performing organization and uh, service providers uh, now is not well defined uh, and um, well developed and uh, this is an important issue. Therefore, Enrico, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marilisa. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to present briefly um, the goals of these projects and how it will uh, contribute to the EOSC uh, goals and implementation phase. Next slide, please. Um, just a brief uh, um, background uh, how this uh, project were, were, was developed. And uh, this is mainly related to, to one of the main pillars of long-term sustainability of research infrastructure. So it meant by staff capability and skills development. And um, these uh, Horizon 2020 RI Train Plus project started this year and will last four years. And it was, um, was following the previous RI Train funded Horizon 2020 project and the previous uh, FP7 Ramiri project, which all this project aims to foster and empower managerial and leader skills of research infrastructure leaders. Of course, there are other national and EU funded projects which contribute to develop staff capability and skill development. And we know all well that, that staff capability and skills development is uh, an important component of uh, uh, European open science cloud and open innovation strategy as well. Next slide, please. So this, um, RI Train Plus uh, projects uh, aims to develop um, uh, and design and develop a training program to uh, fulfill uh, the requirements of competency, uh, managerial competency profile of current and also future managers of research infrastructure with uh, a clear look at uh, sustainable training. What does it mean? So as we have seen uh, at, at the moment, uh, currently in the current ecosystem, training is scattered between different providers and with limited um, focus on developing managerial skills, specializing the contents of training to this kind of uh, leaders, uh, scientists mainly with a scientific background, holding managerial position within research organizations, uh, infrastructure and core facility as well. And so for the first time, uh, this project bring together research infrastructure, core facilities and universities at the same time to uh, in a strong collaboration efforts to develop this kind of training in a sustainable way. Uh, the project um, includes uh, 16 research infrastructure with plus uh, three linked third parties. Um, uh, between beneficiary nine uh, are university, uh, nine are research infrastructure, and we also have a network of core facilities which uh, allows to uh, enlarge the network to more than 100 core facilities in Europe. And also because of the network universities and leagues within the, the partnership, uh, we are able to, to have a network, enrich a network very wide of 83 university engagement. We also have the support of a, many other infrastructure with uh, uh, amounting to 18 associated partners, which are very interested in developing, supporting, collaborating in developing this kind of, uh, of, field, of projects. Um, of course, uh, uh, what does sustainable means in this, in this perspective? Apart from uh, delivering continuous uh, professional development uh, for research infrastructure and core facility managers, of course, um, here the, the approach is to develop something which can be transferable. And so uh, the approach is to, to develop the conditions for uh, fostering this kind of training to be provided also by the other universities, other providers well accredited in this perspective. 
also the, the, the approach is to develop not only in training the current managers of, and leaders of research infrastructure and core facilities, but also to prepare the management capabilities of scientists for the future leaders of this research organization. And so here we, work, we want to work strong, strongly in partnership with the um, uh, university in developing uh, some uh, longitudinal uh, learning track specifically aimed to foster competencies for people that have a scientific background, but also moving from bachelor to doctoral level to include some competencies also in leading projects, data management, fair principles as well, but also issues like developing a business model for the organization, negotiation, team building and leadership skills as well, especially also financial management because it's an important part for leaders with a scientific background to interact and manage this kind of organization. Then we'll develop a staff and knowledge change between research infrastructure and in particular to develop a community of practice. All these activities, apart from the current delivery within the project, uh, foster to develop something sustainable in a sustainable way. And this is very challenging approach of this project to foster the creation of, uh, uh, to prepare, I would say, the environment to, to launch a European school for management of research infrastructure and core facility as well. As you know, this is a very challenging goal. Um, it requires a long time, but we, we, we expect that this will create the long lasting uh, and viable condition for sustainable training within research infrastructure and prepare current and future manager of research infra infrastructure. Next slide, please. I just briefly go inside these uh, specific activities within each uh, of these uh, building blocks and also to show you how this will uh, contribute uh, in particular and, and what are the linkage uh, that can be uh, developed with other EOSC and uh, FAIR initiative that are going, still going on. Um, with the, the development of the academic longitudinal learning track and on managerial skills here, we, we, need, we want to uh, develop a survey on training needs. And of course, these, uh, these activities are still are well ongoing also on the FAIR and uh, data management issues. And here there are a lot of collaboration opportunities and um, synergies. Uh, to update the competence profile, which were, was uh, previously de developed within the right train uh, project. And of course, uh, engaging with the universe in design of these uh, learning activities across uh, STEM, uh, bachelor's, uh, master's and doctoral levels, which can be certifiable within the universities in Europe and also can be de delivered by each university in a common within a common standard, accepted standard. Then uh, within the continuous develop activities, we, apart from the delivery of specific initiatives and training program on, uh, uh, as you can see here, on uh, research infrastructure life size, LC principles, data policy and management, innovation, entrepreneurship and stakeholder engagement, socioeconomic impact and team building and developing coaching program. All these training courses, apart from the delivery will be uh, designed uh, having in mind a uh, sustainable uh, delivery in the next future. So to prepare this course design and training kit and prepare also with a coaching program, those people who can be trained of trainers in the next future. Uh, then we have a staff exchange and apart from staff and knowledge programs and visits between uh, research infrastructure, we will have also secondments within these visits for a short period of times, but also uh, the community of practice on managerial and governance issues of uh, research infrastructure and core facilities between uh, um, practitioners or leaders already working within this, this infrastructure. We think that this will strengthen our, our, on the uh, existing current uh, activity within uh, um, the research infrastructure ecosystem, but the idea is to to develop something which last uh, also uh, ahead, uh, also uh, when the, the pro the, this project will, will be ended also uh, to, to continue in this perspective. And so in this, uh, within this perspective, the creation of the environment and preconditions for launching 
uh, the schools in particular to design uh, the, the business model of these schools, the, the interest uh, involved interested parties, the universities, the business school, and all interested parties, partners, uh, in particular research infrastructure and core facilities as well, and policy makers will create the condition for designing, co-creating, uh, co-designing this, uh, this, uh, this model for, for the next future. We think that if we we'll succeed, that this will be the, the, the real legacy for a sustainable training initiative, in particular, also within this approach, all the uh, training initiatives that are already still going on with, within other projects and EOS in particular, will be uh, in, in jointly embedded within this, uh, this uh, pattern of developing uh, uh, of this project, but also for the next future as well. And um, thank you. This is uh, the opportunity that we see for, for fostering a new collaboration and partnership with um, EOS as well. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you. Um, and now um, I, I want to give the floor to Federica Garbuglia from the European University Association. Um, and she will talk about how the FAIRS FAIR project is developing practical tools to help higher education institutions to integrate FAIR data competences into curricula at the bachelor, master, and doctoral uh, level. So my question to Federica is, what practical tools is the Fair Fair project designed to help the development of this, uh, this curricula? Federica. Thank you, Maria Luis. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Federica Garbuglia, and I'm a policy and project officer at the European University Association. Just a few words about, about my organization. We are the representative organization of uh, higher education institutions and national rectors conference, and uh, we uh, represent the voice of, univer of uh, universities in Europe. But today I'm also representing the first fair project and in particular the work package seven, uh, which is uh, being led by EUA also as an effort to bring the uh, project's results closer to universities and to other relevant stakeholders. Uh, the work package seven of first fair, as um, you can see from the slide, aims at fostering the integration of fair data education in university curricula. We are now in the last year of, uh, of the project and we have ahead of us two uh, final practical tools that we are currently developing and that will uh, be published at the end of this year in December 2021. Um, uh, just before going a little bit in details uh, and talking to you in details about these tools, I just would like to point out that uh, they are not existing in isolation, but they are very well rooted in uh, all the work that the work package has done uh, in the past two years, especially we uh, did a survey to map the existing condition of uh, fair data education in Europe. We did a desk research of similar projects and initiative, and most importantly, we also did, uh, we also developed a competence framework, a fair competence framework, which is integrating and also um, uh, existing uh, um, together with other competence frameworks that are already uh, available. Uh, you can find a link to all these free deliverables in, uh, in the slides. Uh, so now to talk about the practical tools, uh, this will be a fair adoption handbook for universities, which will uh, present model courses and curricula to um, practically support universities um, in the announcement of the provision for fair and RDM trainings. Uh, we not only want to provide universities with, uh, um, with um, courses, uh, example of courses that they can use, but we also want to take a didactic approach, so showing uh, how to uh, teach the first principles at the different level within the um, university programs. And uh, the adoption handbook will be complemented by uh, a good practices report. Uh, in the good practice report, uh, um, again, we not only aim to just present a list with uh, uh, successful case studies of universities that were um, able to um, develop a training provision for FAIR and RDM, but we will also try to extract some conclusion, but also some recommendation, especially to guide universities who would like to uh, undergo similar our efforts and to show them how to kick off these activities, but also how to implement them and how to um, ensure that the impact is uh, sustainable in the long run. 
Um, this, um, I refer to this tool as practical tools more than once, and also in, uh, you in your question, Maria Luis, and I would like to um, also underline why we, we think this will be practical tools. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so here, I, um, uh, we uh, found out that uh, there are now very, uh, very many challenges and needs when we talk about fostering the, um, fostering the uptake of fair competencies in university teachings. Uh, these challenges and needs were very um, uh, much present in um, uh, two surveys that we did. The first one is the first fair survey that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, the other survey is the EUA Open Science Survey which um, is not yet available, uh, but will be published at the beginning of July. Um, the three main challenges that we identified in uh, the uptake of FAIR competencies are the awareness of FAIR principles, which uh, is a little bit increasing, but is still lagging behind among researchers and students. Uh, then there is uh, the implementation gap because universities are more and more realizing the strategic importance of uh, uh, teaching FAIR and RDM, but also practicing FAIR and RDM. But the implementation is not keeping up with this uh, recognized importance. And the last big challenge is, of course, the provision of trainings, which are uh, still not at a sufficient level in all the, um, uh, in, uh, the bachelor, master and doctoral program in universities. Uh, what is interesting to notice is that uh, um, universities really identified the need to uh, receive practical guidance on how to apply FAIR, uh, but also how to teach FAIR. And this is, uh, this is where uh, we believe that our uh, tools will, uh, will uh, sustain universities uh, in, this, in this effort, because we will not only provide courses, but we will only provide reasons and uh, um, a reason on why fair should be fair should be applied, why fair should be practices, practice it. Um, I would now like to just point two needs that I think are very important. Um, one is that universities should uh, uh, also point their efforts toward uh, the a better integration of uh, RDM and fair provision in their open science policies, especially because um, if we talk uh, in particular about fair practices, they are just mentioned as encouraging, uh, they are just encouraged and not that they are not ma uh, made mandatory. And this is of course uh, still limiting the, uh, the uptake of, uh, of fair and of fair competencies because then there is not the, the surrounding uh, uh, infrastructures, the infrastructure skills and awareness and also a system of rewards needed to, um, to sustain uh, the, the uptake of fair and also to, um, uh, to have researchers engage with, uh, with fair practices. But all, in all these institutions uh, should not feel like they have to do everything by themselves. And, they, um, and what is important is that also an, um, uh, these initiatives that uh, uh, are born at the institutional level then find a support in the international uh, European, but also in the national framework with a set of policies that can in the long term ensure uh, a sustainable uh, uptake of the of fair, uh, compete, fair data and RDM competencies. Of course, here, uh, when I talk about uh, uh, European, uh, the European, um, uh, the European um, framework, I also refer to EOSC. And uh, since we are at the EOSC symposium, I wanted to point out how in uh, the survey we conducted, uh, we noticed how university now have a better knowledge of what uh, EOSC is and what are the benefits that he has to offer. But what is lacking is still the capacity uh, within the universities to engage with EOSC and also the use cases. So they don't know how to engage with EOSC. And this is something that uh, we believe should be also addressed if we want a better engagement of uh, higher education institutions with the EOSC. So uh, to, uh, to conclude that these are uh, the main points that we think our, uh, our tools will, uh, will, um, will address. And uh, I also wanted to mention that we are not uh, developing these tools just by ourselves in the first fair project, but we value also the feedback of the wider community. And to this, um, uh, to this, uh, to this end, 
I would like to point out that we will organize two uh, university workshops in the autumn. Unfortunately, right now we don't have registration open yet, but I invite you all to uh, follow the news on the first fair um, newsletter uh, and the website, but also on the UA website or to contact me if you would like to receive more information because we will further present these results and also we will ask for the feedback of, uh, of, the, of the community. Thank you, Federica. Thank you very much. Um, we actually are a little bit late, therefore um, I encourage uh, to be alive in the chat, but we, can, we have no time for a question, unfortunately. So I want to proceed with the, the last panel, the last panel on upskilling countries to engage in NEOSC. And um, I want to start giving the floor to Ellen Clare uh, from Open Air, Open Air Communities of Practice. Uh, uh, for training coordinators provides an informal space for uh, to unite open science training professionals uh, and they have done an investigation in their own countries so, so my question to Ellen is what are the primary gaps identified by the open air community of practice in upskilling countries After, oh, afternoon everyone um yeah, I'll just put some links in the chat before before I answer the question um, that, that I'll refer to just during the, this next few minutes. You are, you are muted, Ellen, you are muted. Thank you. <laughs> Start again. Um, yeah, I've just put some links in the chat um, to what I'll be referring to over the next few minutes. Uh, the Community of Practice for Open Science Training Coordinators um, to answer your question, in, it, in itself, it meets a gap. Um, it was set up um, in 2018 by Open Air to, um, to bring together training coordinators. So open science trainers, but particularly those that have responsible, some kind of strategic responsibility. Uh, there was a need to, to um, provide a space for sharing and exchange of, of practical issues. So we currently have 86 members um, from a variety of different types of organization, projects, institutions, research infrastructures, um, nations. We're mainly European in focus, but we do have members from uh, the US, Canada, and Australia. And I think the key point is that it is bringing together like-minded people to exchange experience. Um, there's definitely a gap, a demand for that. Um, as I say, we're increasing in membership month by month. Our current um, monthly meetings um, have about 25 people regularly um, attend. And although the community was set up by Open Air, it's very much driven by members now. I'm currently the chair for this year with Irina Kuchma as the co-chair, but we, we rotate responsibilities. Um, we do have a series of monthly meetings, and um, I think this is one of the reasons that, that we've increased our numbers recently, is that we have um, various projects and initiatives sign up to present on their good practice. So they um, were booked up until November now, so you can see that it's obviously meeting some kind of, of need. Um, so it, that's in terms of what we actually do. It's a, it's, it's a gap bringing together trainers who um, from different stakeholders, but it's also bringing together like-minded people, which I think is a gap, is that, that often those supporting training within the organizations or, or having that hard job of trying to convince others that training is important and make sure that it is implemented. So it's a space for us to share practice and experience. If you can move to the next slide, please. In terms of the gaps um, that our community has, has identified and addressed, uh, well, there's, the community itself, its purpose really is to identify gaps in knowledge and experience um, and, and come together to try and address those gaps. So in terms of activities, we have uh, put together events. One recent event last year was about uh, GDPR and training. So we identified many of us were struggling with how to cope with new GD GDPR regulations. So how can we do that? And we captured that and uh, created a, a shared resource. Uh, there's currently a working group or task force being set up around making training materials fair. So this builds on the work that's been previously done around 10, 10 simple steps to, to fair training materials, which I put in the chat. But we felt that there's um, still a need for more, more guidance in this area. Um, we've run events uh, last year, for example, uh, training in the EOSC. 
that was um, an event that brought together members of the community, including those involved in EOSC projects, to look at rules of participation. We also provide um, expertise where there are gaps maybe in projects and they need expertise, then members of our community can quite often um, contribute in this area. So for example, several of our members in their EOS capacities were involved in the Digital Skills and Fair and Open Science report um, last year. So as I said, we have a lot of expertise within our members, so it's, it's good to be able to, to share that and contribute where we can. But one of the reasons that we do get together is to try and make sure that we don't overlap, that we actually um, you know, build on the work of, of others. So one of the activities we're doing at the moment is to look at the recommendations that came out of the EOSC Skills and Training Working Group report. There were seven recommendations and we want to try and map the activities that we know about um, within our community. So these could be EOSC projects, RDA, they could be institutional initiatives um, and try and see you know, what's already happening before we start taking any further steps forward. So again, the link to that mapping um, is in the links that I posted. So please, we'd encourage anybody watching this to, to take a look and please do, do add your activities to that spreadsheet. But I think finally for me, one of, one of the, the valuable gaps that, um, that the community fills is in terms of providing a, a, a space for that informal um, collaboration. So many of us are involved in projects and initiatives but this is an informal space free from the constraints of those projects and the deliverables that are required where we can actually step back and look at the big picture and see you know, what's needed and what we can do to address those issues. So if you're interested in joining our community, again, the links uh, are posted in the chat, so please do join. And we've got several members on the call today. So if anybody else wants to add, contribute their own views on, on the value of the community of practice, please do. And that's all I had to say. Thank you, Ellen. Th thank you very much. Um, and now I want to give the floor to Francesca Di Donato from the CNR in Italy, uh, asking what instruments are being developed to upskill Italy on open science. Uh, Maria Luisa, I think there was a change in the in the speaker for this. Uh... So for this Emma. presentation, so it will be me presenting. Thank you. Very well. <laughs> Thanks. Very uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, so today I, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the work that has been done, as Luisa, Maria Luisa was saying, uh, about the upskilling uh, of Italy uh, to embrace open science fair principles and facilitate participation in EOSC. Uh, many of you probably already know that uh, in Italy, we um, have um, set up a forum uh, for exchanging and coordinating actions uh, towards the participation in the European Open Science Cloud. This forum is called ICDI, the Italian Competence, uh, Computing and Data Infrastructure. Uh, it's um, actually a forum that was set up in 2018, so um, a couple of years ago. And recently, uh, by the end of, of last year, we uh, started the, the works and activity towards the realization of uh, the National Competence Center in our country. So the mission of this Competence Center is to create a network of experts, uh, initiatives and research infrastructures uh, that have uh, functional skills uh, to support the, the national community uh, for open science fair principles and facilitate the, the participation of our community, national community in EOSC. Um, so, um, as far as today, uh, we have a task force uh, that comprises more than 50 members, um, and uh, these members are experts in, uh, uh, in the fields that you see in this slide, so we have legal and ethical uh, experts, um, experts in uh, uh, defining policies and strategy uh, around the thematic that we cover. Uh, we have sector-specific competencies 
residencies uh, that come from the uh, national node of the research infrastructures and other uh, disciplinary activities uh, around uh, open science uh, in our country. Uh, we uh, have experts in open access and research data management according to FAIR principles and data management plans. Next slide, please. So uh, we perform a number of different uh, uh, activities and uh, some of them already started, as I said, we uh, set up this competence center um, at the end of last year. Uh, so it's been uh, our first uh, six months uh, of, of uh, activities. So we are already starting uh, delivering some of the activities that you see here. We aim at of, um, uh, designing training activities uh, to uh, develop and share guidelines and best practices uh, in the national community. Uh, we already uh, support and advise uh, both uh, uh, the different stakeholders uh, spanning from uh, researchers to um, research performing or funding organizations. Um, we uh, make available uh, various services and tools that uh, are uh, based on the emerging needs of our community. And we also um, uh, will deliver soon and publish soon um, a, a resource catalog uh, for uh, the Competence Center. Uh, so these on, on uh, the right side of this slide, so you can see some numbers and features that we already uh, managed to uh, deliver. Uh, we uh, deliver two uh, full uh, courses in 2021, um, also with a community designed approach, because as said, we uh, have some members from uh, uh, all the research infrastructures that uh, have nodes in our countries. So what we're trying to do is to reach a specific community and design uh, activities and courses for them. Um, uh, we uh, have trained so far, so in the first six months of this year, more than 300 researchers uh, in open science with uh, a full course or of uh, 10 hours. Uh, and we also uh, started a, um, uh, a series of events uh, to deepen the thematic uh, around open science. And in these, uh, in these events, we already uh, managed to to involve more than 1,000 participants. Uh, so this is uh, uh, everything that I wanted to highlight for the competence centers. Thank, thank you, you Maria Luisa. Thank you, thank you, Emma, for this overview of what is going on in, uh, in Italy. And now let's uh, move to another region of Europe, the Western Balkan uh, in the South Slav uh, Slavic speaking countries. I want to invite Nadika Milikovic uh, to tell us what instruments are being developed to upskilling these countries. And um, she will talk about boosting EOSC readiness and creating scalable model for capacity building uh, in uh, RDN, please. Unfortunately, Nadika is not here, so I'm replacing her. Uh, Milka, so, welcome. <laughs> yes, yes, the change was uh, quite recent because Nadica couldn't attend. Uh, she was our project leader, but I'm part of the team, so I'll try to show uh, what we've done uh, during the project. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, briefly outline the, the context uh, and the landscape in the Slavic-speaking Western Balkan countries. Why Slavic-speaking Western Balkan countries? Those countries have a uh, shared past, their institutions are quite the same, uh, very similar, they remain the same. Uh, also, uh, the mentality of researchers uh, is the same. So what researchers know and don't know is uh, a sh something shared among our countries. And also our languages are quite similar, we can understand uh, each other. Uh, which is a significant advantage, having in mind that our research communities and our librarians communities are quite small. So it's considerable effort producing materials in the local language uh, that would be used uh, in such a small uh, community. So that's the economy behind the idea for, for the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
the project was very logical. It was meant to address uh, the gaps. Uh, in our countries, in the Western Balkans, we have uh, quite developed open access journals. They are mostly uh, diamond open access journals, and they are indexed in the OAJ. And this is something that is fairly, fairly okay. Also, uh, we either have open science policies or, uh, or these policies are being defined, but some progress has been made. And uh, there is a growing number of uh, uh, publication repositories, institutional repositories for open, open access publications. And considerable uh, progress has been made during, uh, during the open air project. Uh, open, open air provided significant support to both policy development in our countries and to repository de infrastructure de de development. But research data management was an issue that was completely unaddressed. Uh, the concept of research data management uh, was before the project, it was known most, mostly to uh, informed individuals, to in researchers involved uh, in European projects or to a small number of librarians. And uh, as we entered the NIFOS Europe project, which strongly focuses on our readiness for EOSC and uh, open science practices uh, in, in the region of, the south, of Southeast Europe, uh, it was apparent that we, we will, the, the gap, uh, the knowledge gap will become even, uh, even, deep, even deeper uh, if we don't address the issue of research data management. For example, uh, in Western Balkan countries, research data alliance is not, uh, not very well established. In Serbia, we don't have a research data alliance node, uh, and not many researchers are involved there. So uh, this gap should, should, be, should have been addressed. That's why we drafted the project, and this project is embedded between open air and, uh, and NIFOS Europe. So, once the project is finished, it, it, it was finished in March this year, all the activities uh, uh, carried out during this project will be continued uh, within the NIFOS Euro project and uh, within the national open science initiatives that Eleni Tolly was talking about uh, yesterday. So this is very important to know about this project. So what was the idea of the project? We, uh, we had uh, in mind a set of deliverables that could be used and reused after the project in all these countries. But we also had in mind uh, to set up a model how this issue could be uh, dealt with in countries with less resources uh, and countries with smaller research communities that may not be part of the European Union and that may not be uh, so strongly involved in, uh, in European projects. So that was basically the idea. So the training materials uh, produced include uh, the, uh, the website, uh, which is very informative and which is very easy to use. And all these materials that are available on the website were produced by the project team and then can, they can be reused. Uh, they, they can be read already now, but they can be reused. They are published under the CC BY license uh, in other countries uh, in the region. Uh, also, now we did some training for uh, decision makers at the university, and one of the outcomes uh, was that a person, a dedicated person, was appointed at the University of Belgrade to provide support to researchers uh, in all the issues uh, regarding research data management, which is new. We didn't have such a person. And uh, also the issue of training and uh, training for uh, data stewards, training for librarians that would uh, deal with research data, this issue was open. We expect this issue to be uh, addressed in the future, but this issue is now somewhere in the air. Uh, decision makers are familiar with this issue, which was not the case uh, before. Uh, also, we had very intensive training for librarians, and uh, I believe that we managed to, to change the situation significantly because the body of librarians that are now informed about research data management uh, is, is growing. Uh, but also, what, what, is, what 
was particularly interesting for researchers and that can be used, which can be used as a model for other country, even more, more developed ones, was our collaboration uh, with the open air uh, team, uh, actual, uh, namely with the, the team uh, behind Argos, uh, the, the tool, the service uh, enabling uh, drafting of research data of the data management plans. We had very close collaboration, which will be continued, and uh, we actually localize the software interface. Now uh, our researchers can use uh, Argos, and they have the explanations provided uh, in the language that is familiar to them in, the, in their mother tongue. Uh, based on this translation, uh, other countries from the region can prepare their translations, and this would be much easier because uh, they don't have to start translating the tool from the interface from, from scratch. We also established a dummy, well, actually a pilot uh, Dataverse instance. Uh, this is not to be used now in, in the shape it is currently, but uh, it is just for demonstration purposes uh, when negotiating with decision makers, with our ministry responsible for science, because it needs significant investment. But uh, another effect of our training was that actually researchers started using uh, institutional repositories for research data. There has been a growing interest in depositing research uh, uh, data in institutional repositories. And what's interesting, uh, and uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, at this moment, this is quite specific for, uh, for Serbia, they prefer uh, institutional repository to, to deposit their research data in institutional repositories because of the trust and because of long-term preservation. So it's a new situation for us, a very interesting one. Uh, also, uh, next slide, please. Uh, our team uh, will continue working uh, uh, on, on all these activities. Uh, we, are now, we have now just established the Open Science Community Serbia. This is an international initiative. We don't have a website yet because it was established some 10 days ago, but we, we will continue with our informal activities uh, through this uh, association. Also, all team members are uh, members of the National Open Science Team that was established uh, in 2020 and uh, which continued working during this year. Uh, this is expected to be uh, actually the, the core of the National Open Science Cloud Initiative. Uh, that is to be developed within the NIFAS Europe project. And we already prepared uh, some drafts, uh, for example, for policy amendments and uh, some, uh, some suggestions for the team. Uh, in our experience, uh, we have quite good experience in Serbia with bottom-up initiatives. Uh, it's very helpful when all the materials are prepared and presented to decision, decision makers as uh, ready-made materials that they can just uh, adjust or slightly alter and then uh, adopt. It's very difficult to start preparing uh, at this high level. It's very difficult to start preparing these document, uh, documents from scratch. So basically, this is what we, uh, what we found as a, a quite successful way of dealing with, uh, uh, with such issues as research data management to Serbia and other environments. There may be other, other issues. Uh, establishing a team, uh, relying on bottom-up approach, uh, engaging uh, the research community, and then uh, just joining some larger initiatives uh, that may be uh, supported from top-down. Uh, and also, uh, I have to say in Serbia, most, uh, most developments related to open science were significantly supported uh, by European projects. They wouldn't, be, wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible uh, without European projects. So this is, this is a kind of our recipe. Thank you. Thank you, Milika. Thank you, Milika, and congratulations for the achievement that uh, you reached so far. And now um, we have the last presentation for this uh, session, and I invite uh, Marcin Plosienik, uh, I hope that I pronounce not very badly. Uh, I want to ask uh, what technological platform is in the EOSC Synergy project uh, planning to develop to facilitate upskilling? 
Uh, okay, thank you for uh, this introduction and for uh, the ability to uh, to present this. So uh, at the beginning, maybe I will say a few words about uh, EOS Synergy itself. So uh, we moved from uh, Balkans area now to, uh, well, the project is coordinated by CSIC from Spain. So it's uh, one of uh, EOS Synergy is one of five B regional project uh, and uh, projects. And this is about Spain, Portugal, UK, um, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, Netherlands, and Germany. So um, basically, uh, we integrate capacities uh, like HPC, uh, storage, and repositories from participating European member states. And we are promoting also um, uh, EOS plus research communities. So uh, we are saying here about 10 thematic services. So one of the EOS synergy goal is, is expand uh, uh, training and educational capabilities through uh, online platforms. And, but this is not only about online platforms, but uh, the, the outcomes uh, that we provide are the guidance and best practices for creating uh, good quality tutorials. So we are saying here about a uh, number of items that we are providing. So from analysis and design sessions, uh, and, uh, design workshops or based on IBC learning design, but also a lot of the materials forms uh, like uh, training analysis forms and guide, guidance on, on formats and tools to create content. So then we also um, uh, support and, and create uh, tutorials on, on EOS, on, on, uh, on tools, on, and also thematic services, as I mentioned, it's 10 of the thematic services. And then uh, uh, we focus on online platforms for content creation and, and hosting of training materials. Uh, uh, we are focusing on, on MOOC kind of uh, platforms and, and on, uh, um, software that, that can be run and, and platform that can uh, be easy and support running hackathons. So, um, so for this uh, point, for, um, we made at the beginning of, uh, of our uh, project initiative, uh, we make uh, quite a, a advanced uh, research, this research for over 31 platforms comparing features and then uh, we selected nine uh, of those uh, most promising uh, platforms uh, and, and check them against 31 criteria. We also compared uh, 12 previous initiatives uh, and running and previews uh, for the tool sets, what they are using, not only as a, an, an online platform, but all, what are other tools and, and uh, also about lessons learned. And we compared against 25 criteria. We created a report out of this that um, might be of interest for some, some of you. Uh, so, and, and in, um, uh, finally, uh, uh, we are also uh, interacting with the sum of the things that are uh, being happening now with national educational programs uh, um, to develop suitable um, courses, uh, but also um, trying to engage with selected universities to understand their needs and, um, and support with uh, relevant tools and, and also the um, tutorials, materials and, and courses. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, basically, uh, uh, we have followed up uh, um, uh, containerized education trend, and we are on um, um, containerized le learning trend, and we are focused uh, on online uh, learning courses. Uh, so our unique selling point uh, is the Hackathon as a Service platform that supports the organization of the online uh, uh, hackathons. And, and uh, so basically, uh, we provide a modular set of the tools. Uh, we call it uh, uh, Learn at Synergy platform. Uh, so basically, this is uh, this consists of of the uh, where uh, on top there's uh, 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 WordPress with a list of the courses, introduction. Uh, there is uh, uh, we are using one SSO with federated login. And uh, we, we use uh, Moodle uh, in the end, uh, a customized instance. Um, and this is also important from um, interoperability perspective, but also the set of other tools like video conferencing uh, based on EduMeet, uh, interactive computing based on Jupyter Notebook, uh, so shared drive, but also infrastructure manager. So we, we uh, allow and give tools to um, deploy the training infrastructure, um, uh, this, these are the tools for trainers. So Hackathon as a service basically facilitates organization of hackathons uh, on EOSC infrastructure. 
and is accessible through use portal. So basically this is a hackathon organizer can create, publish hackathons, uh, uh, describe rules, technical requirements, um, offer uh, infrastructure uh, that will be automatically deployed um, for the participants. Um, uh, also control who participates in hackathons, uh, do statistics, uh, uh, evaluate participate solutions and uh, a number of, of other features. So uh, currently th those, those set of the tools uh, uh, raise quite some interest also of other initiatives and projects where we are discussing with some other projects that would like to follow that approach and uh, reproduce uh, maybe with different uh, branding but similar, uh, similar approach. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we are on time with this um, uh, with this panel, and um, and therefore I want to open for a question. I see that in the chat there are lots of questions and already answers. Um, a very alive contribution from uh, from the audience today. So I wonder whether. There are specific questions for the panelists uh, of the upskilling up countries to engage in EOSC and also in the previous panel. If not, uh, for the moment, uh, let me uh, comment that uh, there are several, uh, many actually, initiatives um that are already ongoing on uh, on these issues very important and very important will be to link uh, the the work of the task forces with all these initiatives and we will uh, also uh, update the message from the contribution that we um, we got during this um, uh, symposium um, in the uh, in the final version of the of the charters and um, and for the aims of the of the task forces, um, I must say that uh, the task forces within this um, advisory group on research careers and curricula um, are really focused on training and the skills agenda. Uh, we need to involve multiple stakeholders. Uh, uh, and specifically the research communities, uh, of course, uh, the data stewards, and, uh, and but also the national bodies. Um, in particular, the data stewardship curricula and career path task force um, will define the data stewardship curricula to ensure that these uh, are really well recognized and aligned across uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and also attention should be paid to career paths to ensure appropriate recognition and rewards for data management activities. Uh, the task force on research careers recognition and credits uh, in parallel with the data stewardship uh, task force uh, will address incentives for researchers to manage and share their data, their code and other research output. And this should uh, include criteria on open science and FAIR being part of the selection and promotion criteria. Therefore, um, the universities and also the other national bodies really should um, contribute um, in this um, and this consider this uh, as part of assessment as ex exercise and also uh, data prices. Uh, about the upskilling countries to engage in EOSC task force. Uh, this task force will uh, recognize the significant developments in open science uh, education uh, that should be and is being addressed in the, at the member state level and within research performing organization and other disciplinary groups and um, will assist in aligning skills uh, initiative and supporting the onboarding uh, of all this uh, into, into EOSC. I think that these are the main takeaway message uh, that we got from the work, extraordinary work that has been done by the uh, task force 
um, up to now and, um, and the contribution that we got from the, from the community. So I don't know whether there are comments or other questions from the audience. If not, um, let me invite you to join again the EUSCO symposium tomorrow at nine. Um, at nine, there will be a session on engagement and cross fertilization between research infrastructure and the EUSCO ecosystem. Research infrastructure are pillars of the um, European research area and the role in the ESC ecosystem is uh, very uh, important. They link up with the communities and they also are uh, you know, the ones that are really uh, developing the community. They, they are the link with the community needs. The chair of this session will be Suzanne de Mouchel. And uh, after this session, there will be the presentation of the uh, the uh, advisory group on sustaining EOSC. Uh, the chair will be Bob Jones from the CERN. Uh, and then after the lunch break again, or during the lunch break, actually, there will be the, um, again, the EOSC clinic, uh, this beautiful initiative that uh, has been so successful today. Uh, and there will be open question and answer through the, uh, via Slido and Ronan, Byrne uh, and Suzanne de Michel will answer uh, to your question. And lastly, in the afternoon, there will be the presentation of the technical challenges on EOSC task force uh, with the chair of, of Klaus Toppelman. And with this, I thank you very much. And um, I hope to see you again and to, and let's be in touch for the development of these task forces and advisory group. Thank you very much.